Here we are at the early morning hours. Uh, prior to launch, the vehicle is being prepared. Meanwhile, the crew is inside the suit room uh, getting into and testing out their suits. Uh, yours truly, uh, followed by the pilot Scott Horowitz, Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force. Dr. Mary Ellen Weber, Mission Specialist Number One. Our MS-2, our flight engineer and lead spacewalker, uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Williams. Army Colonel retired, Jim Voss. And Air Force Colonel Susan Helm. Finally, but certainly not least, Yuri Yusachev, Russian cosmonaut. This is his third flight. He has over one year in space. After being suited up and having the suits tested out, we walked out to the Astro van, and this is a special moment for the crew. Uh, it's our a chance to wave goodbye to many of the people who are a big part of what's about to happen. It, it's certainly an emotional high point for the crew. Our job uh, is to go out to the vehicle and to strap in. We actually strap in two people at a time, one, one person in the flight deck, as you see here. Simultaneously, somebody in the mid-deck is being strapped in. And you can see it's a tight fit. You have to be careful not to hit the switch, switches over your head but at the same time slide into your, your seat. This was the first flight of the glass cockpit, the new and improved cockpit that all shuttles will be upgraded to. It provided a greater level of situation awareness for all the crew members in all phases of flight. Now comes the moment of truth. Uh, the main engine's light six seconds prior to uh, liftoff. The entire vehicle shudders against the bolts holding us to the pad, and then boom, the solid rocket booster's light seven and a half million pounds of thrust we leap off the pad and before we know it we're rolling upside down and heading up to the uh, northeast to go join the space station it's quite a ride while we're on the solid rocket boosters the vehicle shakes quite a bit uh, it's almost hard to read your displays uh, in 44 seconds we're going supersonic straight up which is quite a thrill and then in two minutes five seconds we've used up all the fuel in the solid rocket boosters there's a loud explosion as they uh, depart the vehicle and are carried off with their small engines on the side. You can see here, it's a glorious sight right at sunrise. And then the main engines uh, sucking fuel out of that orange tank there at about a rate that would empty an Olympic swimming pool in 20 seconds uh, propels us to orbit. And in eight minutes and 30 seconds, we're going uh, just slightly less than 18,000 miles an hour as uh, we get inserted into orbit. All right, after we get to orbit, uh, the main engine shut down. We call that Miko. And then there's another loud explosion. And the external tank, this amazing footage here shows the external tank leaving us. And uh, we will fly up and away from the tank. And you'll get a great shot here of the uh, tank going below us before it re-enters. And look at the uh, burn marks on the bottom of the tank and the scorch marks from the engines. Well, the first thing we had to do during this flight after we got on orbit is rendezvous with the space station. This sequence of shots shows us as we come up from behind and below and then fly in front of and finally above the International Space Station. And we make our final approach from above coming down. This is a view inside the cockpit. Everybody had an important duty during the final approach. Susan, for example, was running the rendezvous computer. Yuri was firing the handheld laser to make sure that our range and range rate were proper. My job, meantime, was to line up the docking target that you see here to make sure we had no angular misalignments. Uh, the final approach shown here, the last few feet, that's the International Space Station at the top half of the screen. That's us in the shuttle in the lower half of the screen. Our approach speed is about one inch per second. Uh, my task is to fly inside the three-inch circle, and uh, it all worked exactly as we had been trained. Right here, I push a button which fires rockets, which thrust us up into the station to make sure uh, we make good contact and good capture. Even though this was the first of many major tasks, you can see there's a moment of relief of, uh, of uh, wow, we got the first one under our belts. Now it's time to go to work inside the space station. As a rookie on the flight, there were many highlights, of course, but uh, perhaps the day after the rendezvous was the biggest highlight. That was the spacewalk. Jim and I had a pre-breathe on 100% oxygen in preparation for the low pressure in the suit. And uh, here I am uh, having a last minute snack before getting suited up in the spacesuit. And here's Jim with uh, me in the back uh, getting the suits on before we enter the airlock and depress to go outside. The spacewalk was a crew intensive activity. Scott ran the checklist from the inside and Mary Ellen ran the robotic arm uh, which moved Jim around during most of the spacewalk.
going outside and having uh, the opportunity to view the earth outside had to be, it was very spectacular. Uh, it was something that I really enjoyed and certainly was the highlight of the mission. And, and I did take an opportunity to look around even though we were working pretty hard. We did several tasks on the uh, spacewalk. Uh, one of the biggest tasks was to take some hardware for a Russian crane, which will be used later in the station assembly. Uh, the previous mission had taken the operator post for that crane up and left it on the space station, and we took the remaining components. Here you see the boom, which is a telescoping boom, which will extend and be used to aid spacewalkers in the future. We're taking it out of the pa we're taking it out of the pa and moving it up on the space station. Again, Mary Ellen was very in intent during the whole EVA moving Jim around on the arm from the aft cockpit. This is the best form of public transportation in the world. Uh, Mary Ellen did a wonderful job moving me around. She never shook me off of the arm. <laughs> I was really happy with that. This is the uh, Strella boom that I was carrying up there to meet Jeff so that he could actually attach it to the operator post. And it's quite heavy and massive. Uh, just I had to turn it around to have it in the right orientation to plug it in. And it was really quite easy to move around in space, even a massive object like this. And when Mary Ellen moved me up, to the right position, uh, then Jeff prepared the operator post. I stuck it over nearby there, and he guided it into position and assembled the two pieces together. It really worked very well. Uh, the Russians built a good piece of hardware here, and it assembled together very nicely. You can see out on the end, there's sort of a ring around the, uh, the boom. That's used for transportation along the boom. You attach a tether to that, and then you can move along the entire length of it without changing your tether. Once it's assembled, these bolts go together. We had to attach another piece to it. And then the entire thing, the boom with the base as well, were removed. Jeff grabbed a, the very bottom piece of it and took it up to the top of the station. And then we moved this entire piece up there and uh, put it back into another location so that it's ready for construction later on. Here you see it actually coming apart and getting ready to move it up higher up on the station. This is an overview kind of what it's like for us when we're moving up there with the station in the background. It's really quite a view. After six hours and about 45 minutes, uh, we did have to go back inside. And uh, this is us doing our final preparations. And then Scott opening the hatch to let us back in after a, a very successful uh, extravehicular activity. We were tired by that time and ready to see them and get something to eat uh, and rest a little bit. Well, the fourth day of the mission was dedicated to doing repairs and upgrades on the external part of the space station. But the fifth day of the mission was really dedicated to the start of what I like to think of as the rescue aspect of the space station, and that was to do the internal repairs and the internal upgrades. The scenery that you see here is uh, someone with a camcorder traveling through the shuttle, going from one end to the other of what's in the payload bay, but then they make this immediate turn and uh, head up into the space station. And I like this view because it shows you basically how massive the structure really is. And this is really less than half of the size it will be when Jim, Yuri, and I return for increment number two. Uh, Jeff and uh, Jim also were busy at work inside what we call the node. Uh, this is a picture of the node. It's, it's quite large and squatty. And it's a marked difference than how you will soon see the Russian segment, which we call the functional cargo block, or the FGB. Along the way, you see duct work. There was a concern prior to our flight about air quality. There were good reasons to be concerned. Uh, we did a lot of extra training to make sure we knew how to assemble this duct work so that we would not have any problems with air quality. And in fact, we took so many measurements of the air that we really did prove that we've solved the problem. Good scene here of Yuri and myself working on the battery. That was our priority, was to get inside the Russian segment, open up the panels, and start work immediately on the parts of the Russian segment that had the most trouble, and those were the storage batteries. Over the period of several days, uh, Yuri and Jim and myself changed out components on four of the six batteries that are used that are used power to the Russian segment. And uh, we were very busy. We had toolkits that we basically floated around with, and we borrowed tools from each other. It was very much like working in your garage, and the work itself wasn't very complicated. But it became complicated when you looked at the aspect of losing your tools in microgravity. And so we spent a lot of time making sure we didn't do that. Uh, we also had some repairs taking place inside the node. 
And uh, this was just one scene of a very, very busy mission. I think overall we were told we had 42 separate repairs that we accomplished in just a few short days. Those of you with sharp eyes may have noticed there aren't a lot of switches inside the space station. And uh, the reason is we've changed to a new ops concept for how we operate space hardware, space station hardware. Jeff here is showing you a computer display, and is, it is through this display that we will do all the functions and controls. Now you're looking in another part of the shuttle. This is the space hab module. It's essentially a room addition that we had out in the payload bay. Here we had over 3,000 pounds of equipment that we had to transfer over to the station. There you see the four batteries that were uh, replaced in the station earlier. Uh, now I'm carrying a large piece of exercise equipment through the tunnels back to the station. Uh, this is just one of the pieces of hardware that we did transfer. Uh, it is important once you transfer it over to strap it down good and tight in preparation for the next station module that we'll be docking with the station. And you can see uh, Jeff and I are about to do that. As I said, it was about 3,000 pounds of equipment that we transferred, exercise equipment, food supplies, personal clothes, as well as environmental equipment. All those bags that you see strapped to the walls of the Russian segment, those are some of the, uh, some of the bags that we brought over. You get some good jobs in space, like a, an EVA, and you get some bad jobs, like having to do the laundry. Somebody had to pack it up for a return home, and I got that job. Uh, you can see all the clutter in the background. It really gets quite crowded after we have all of our equipment out uh, from its stowage. Here Susan and Jeff are working with laptop computers. We get information from the ground, all of our flight plans and that type of information, as well as the capability to uh, do email with our families. Mary Ellen's exercising. You can see her uh, sound system floating there nearby her. It's completely unattached, and she's riding around the world. Of course, you can't go too long without food, and uh, food was a daily part of the activities up here. Here's Scott reaching into one of the food lockers to, uh, to put the meal together for the crew. We had somebody prepare every meal, uh, and then we gathered together, at least for the dinner meal, and shared that on the mid-deck and shared stories of what happened to each other during the day and planned the next mission. And it also gave us an opportunity to uh, celebrate even the small victories. One of the fascinating things in space was, uh, was physics. Uh, and we all turned into little kids from time to time. And here you see a water bubble with two air bubbles that we blew inside it. And Yuri is manipulating it around with a piece of uh, dental floss. Well, we've had a, a, a great mission so far. Uh, we've done all the work we came to do on the uh, space station. And all the repairs are made. And now it's time uh, to leave the International Space Station. And what you see here is uh, sort of the reverse sequence of what Jim showed you earlier with the rendezvous. That's the target uh, moving away on the centerline camera as we undock and move away from the uh, station. We're above the station. Here's an amazing view. Um, you're looking back on the top of your screen at the shuttle as seen from the station uh, via a downlink uh, view from station. Uh, view from station. Uh, we flew up and away from the station, then did a half lap around it and then uh, departed with the retrograde burn and away we flew. And you get some amazing uh, footage here of the, of the world. And next day we cleaned up the shuttle and then it was time to get back in our suits. And you see uh, Jim helping us on the flight deck get into our uh, launch and entry suits. I call them the pumpkin suits. And we did a night entry, which is spectacular. You hit the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound and it literally rips the air apart. And that, what looks like lightning, is actually uh, the plasma exploding out the uh, windows. After uh, 30 minutes of entry, we approached the Kennedy Space Center. That was an infrared view of what it looked like from the ground. And here we are on final approach. Our speed here is slowing down from 300 knots on the outer glide slope. We're on the inner sl the glide slope. At an altitude of 50 feet, I slowly pull the nose up and try to achieve a, a soft touchdown. Uh, our actual touchdown parameters right there were at 199 knots and 3,200 feet down the runway. As soon as I touch down, Scott helps slow us down by deploying the drag chute while I lower the nose to the runway. And then it just takes very, a very gentle rudder pressure to maintain the center line as we roll to a stop and, and uh, Scott jettisons the drag chute. The last shot here is of a very happy crew at the end of a very exciting and a very fruitful mission. And we want to thank each and every one of you for being part of that thumbs up.